Hi, I'm Susan from Happiness Australia and this is my first video in what will be a continuing series of a virtual agora. In this first video obviously it's just going to be me and I will give my opinion and reflections on a poem that I've written. But I first want to state by saying that my reason um, for doing this poem today is not in reaction to anything, it's actually inspired. And I want to talk a little bit about inspiration, what it is. Because sometimes I guess people could think, well, it sounds all very well, someone's inspired, they can just say that. But the way I see, and I see differently, I might be reading information, as today I was having a look over the university sector, and looking at it in an objective way to understand more about the dynamics going on which have created the environments for decisions to be made and taking into account those various pressures and ways of framing the world based on the way people see. Now I opened up um, my USB I don't know why I went to poetry, but I, for some reason, went to poetry. I was looking for something, I think. The poem that jumped out at me was the poem on the alumni must illuminate the world. And I smiled. There was a whole list. I've got lots of poems. I've written 1,500. But this one just jumped out at me. Now, the reason I'm explaining that is, for me, I'm living in the moment, the present moment. And what that means is... I'm living life right now. This is not about being um, analytical or uh, in some way um, saying something in response to something. It's not about that. It's about freedom of expression. I have one of my sort of prevailing strengths, if you like, is communication. I'm very good at communication. I enjoy communicating. I find that for me it's as easy as riding a bike. I can, I can communicate very easily. And so I often feel a sense of empowerment through my ability to communicate and hear my own voice, which is why this virtual agora is commencing. To explain a little bit about Happiness Australia, this acronym is HA, which is to laugh more, because <laughs> we're not laughing. <laughs> we're very serious nowadays. Um, this is because of the economic paradigm, which is very anchored into our society as a prevailing ideology, influencing the way that we think and the way that we see. I'm an economist myself. I've had training in this area. I understand the market system. I understand the dynamics in respect of the imperative for economic growth, the various decisions that are made at corporate levels in order to maximise profits or optimise or find ways to retain wealth, to ensure loyalty, to expand markets, to work on market wafers. This is all coming from a basic ideology that we must make money in order to be secure. This virtual agora is about questioning the basic assumptions that we believe are true and we will defend them. This is what causes the great division in the world is that I'm right, you're wrong. This virtual agora is about expression. There is no right and wrong in this agora. This is simply, if you like, the palette of many ideas which are colours to be displayed to evoke, if you like, another way of seeing. But that way of seeing is up to the person who is viewing this. It is not for me to say that you should see my way. You shouldn't. You should see your way. 
I'm simply just expressing what I see, which is my way. So inherent within what I'm saying here is a philosophical disposition that accepts all viewpoints. That's the premise. That evokes a Socratic dialogue of questioning. Is this true, what we believe? Or is this ideas that have come from centuries of unquestioned thoughts that have led our civilization to this point? We speak of rapid change, transitions, transformations, challenges. We have to think differently. All this rhetoric is swirling around the globe at this point because inherent within that is the fear of change and the awareness that we must change because we have no choice, so we seek power over that change to feel secure. Now, this is the psychology underneath it. To know thyself and be true is one of the most fundamental teachings from philosophers. It is not a wistful, ideological drifting off and thinking it's a nice idea. It is to truly know thyself. Now, that is a big question. Who am I? Who are you? What is the self that we seek to know? And why is it important that we know the self? When I know myself, I'm not acting in unconsciousness, in harmony with other voices who do not know themselves, who are repeating narratives that they were taught through education that was unquestioned. Now, I am just going to do a quick aside before I go into the poem because it's coming to me now to do that. This is to do with the online virtual environments that we've created globally. The question of young people being adaptable, the young people knowing, growing up with technology, and the belief that this is the ideal environment for them in respect of education. And then the thought for me goes to, well, is this inputting knowledge into people or are we extracting wisdom from people? Now, the intellectualism that has been talked about in the 18th century, 17th century, enlightenment, was deep philosophical exploration of questions. This has to be self-reflective in order for us to tap into, is this true? Because intuitively we get a sense of something when we're deeply exploring it. Now, whilst I appreciate and accept that this is an interconnected global cyber community now, it is a virtual world. I am creating a virtual agora. So I'm participating in that world with these videos. But if this becomes the atomization of individuals who are learning in only this way and whilst there is I understand an acknowledgement of the importance of human interaction at what point do profit motives move us away from best interests to in a sense helping us to feel more secure with profit maximization and of course we can get caught up in that we start looking at the balance sheets we see growth we want more growth the shareholders want more you know we feel successful we go forward we think it's ambitious it's great and whilst i'll accept um, there is certainly perspectives on this that are great without doubt there is enormous potential when you can tap into global markets i can see that myself and yes there is cross-cultural interactions. But balance would be my uh, input into this, the balance inherent in human interaction. Females are communicative far more than males. So the online 
sort of cyber reality tends to reflect more of a male pa paradigm in my viewpoint. Um, females love to talk to one another um, and they really need that interaction because they're very emotional feeling um, in respect of their gender. I don't know if that's really been taken into account. When we wrote, learn, in other words, we just learn the information and we reflect it back and we get a mark. Is that developing the intelligences that we need to seriously adapt in an environment of collapsing ecological situations around the world? The melting of the ice caps is not a minor issue. It has intense implications for the magnetic field on the planet. Is this linked to the human electromagnetic field? We are not in separate atomized cells, completely divorced from the external environment as you see behind me. We are one with this, but we forget because we work in offices. We chat with our colleagues. We repeat the narratives that become our truths that become our gods because they're unquestioned. But when you go out into the natural world, has anyone actually lived out there without a caravan, without a hotel, you know, or a nice lodge? Have you got into a sleeping bag and lived in the bush? Have you survived from nature? Because that is what is right around us and it is reacting to us as well as cosmic events. Another factor that you might want to consider with this new reality is what happens when there's solar flare, mass coronial eruptions that knock out all electronic communications. What then? How do people cope with that? What of the isolation of spending hours and hours alone without interaction, without having any competing ideas or narratives? Does that make us intolerant to other perspectives? Do we learn community through families, through interaction, or do, does the family get pulled apart through pressures at work? Does the business community have a responsibility for the time it's taking up of people's lives? Do we continue in this total focus on profit, profit maximisation to regard human beings as human capital? Are we human capital? What is it that human beings actually really want? Is this a reflection of that? Or is this in the imagination of certain people who have various perspectives? Are we really clashing it up and discussing these ideas? Because when we do, we come into something even greater that builds upon those visions, but brings in diversity. And this is the real diversity. When you can bring in diversity, when you do not hang your identity on successful outcomes, when you start to see life as an unfoldment, an opportunity to think again, to reconsider. There's a wonderful piece of wisdom that um, I read many years ago, which said, the love you withhold is the pain you carry. How many people are smiling? How many people are interacting? How many people are sharing their truth with one another? There is a prescription or a prescribed way of communicating that is acceptable. There is other forms that are not. That's intolerance. Do we want that? Or do we want to open up to that difference? So that's just a flow of consciousness that I've just had now. And that's what I mean. I'm not planning anything. I don't plan anything. I just let things happen. And it looks like it's raining, but I'm still going to go ahead. <laughs> Won't, it won't ruin my computer, I don't think. Just enjoy nature. So going back to my poem, Illumini Must Illuminate the, illuminate the World, I think um, it's what my vision is actually of students in the future. Um, and I also am a perpetual life learner. I never stop. I'm always interested. So I'm going to read it out, but I'm going to read it out in sections and then I'm going to give reflections what it means. Because until you ask me, you don't know. I am a student of peace. For peace I must study. Alumni must illuminate, illuminate a real future for students. 
to ruminate truth from falsehood, authenticity from pretense, ethics from unremarkable mission statements, to stand for principles over profit, as the new curricula of a new age, where freedom of speech is not tokenism, but enshrined in a Bill of Rights to advance Australia fair. So essentially what I'm saying there is I am studying peace. I felt moved to study because for peace I feel I have to. The alumni are the ones who have graduated, so these are the people that have accumulated some life experience and they're here to give some illumination to those who come after them. Now, to ruminate truth from falsehood is really simply to ponder, is to really make that an intention for truth as you look at something. Authenticity is really just being who you are. It's not about being your role or seeking to please other people. The pretense is this superficial sort of covering. It's like the mask that many people say they're afraid of. All people are wearing masks. So this vision is really about removing the mask so that we can really say it as it is. We are going to go a lot faster, a lot quicker when we do. If we're trying to be something, we're not going to get anywhere. So this is the deeper aspect. Ethics from unremarkable mission statements. I don't know how many times in my own career I've seen ethics statements or mission statements, which no one lives. <laughs> it's just, it looks nice in its, in its glass encased box but it's not real. So ethics from un so what are the ethics that you're really believing in and are you living them? Or are you just being seen to be in order to market a brand image, which is what everybody's doing when they're saying I'm in this or you're that? So to stand for principles over profit. Now this is the tough one for everyone whose whole profit motive is their reason for being. Without money they think they're nothing. I have no money and I'm not nothing, although my goal is to be nothing, <laughs> but that's another discussion. So to stand for principles over profit, you need to speak up. If you think that something is wrong in the direction of your organisation, you need to speak up and say something. And for those hearing that uh, objection or that different perspective, to deeply listen because it's come to you from life. I see everything is coming from life. People are saying just what they believe in that moment. It could be very important for you later down the track if you open your mind. Where freedom of speech is not a tokenism. So people aren't saying, oh, no, you're free to speak. Please say what you want. Okay, then shut up and sit down. <laughs> freedom of speech is not platitudes. In fact, it's a reality. We are free to speak. There may be a consequence to that freedom. Someone might come and lock you up. Someone might take you out because they don't like what you say. Someone might smear you or set you up in some way because they don't like what you're saying. They see it as a threat. So for them, speech is not freeing. Yet that freedom of speech is what brings in inconvenient truths. That's absolutely in the service of the person who's not liking it. It's only going to benefit them, particularly if the intention is for truth. If the intention is negative, well, the person who's speaking that as a freedom will actually fall on their own sword, as they say. You only hurt yourself if your intention is to hurt others. So the other who is feeling some sort of resistance to what's being said need not worry. If that person's not coming from truth, then eventually it's going to catch up with them anyway. And that's a fundamental universal wisdom. So you can sit back. Now to advance Australia fair, that's in the national anthem here that we Australians have grown up with. Fairness was actually the central identity, if you like, of Australians. To advance this country in a fair way is not about, it's all about me. It's about we. It's about sharing and caring. 
It's about revealing and healing. That, in my view, is the fairness. It's about giving everyone an equal share. They've all participated, they, sh they all should be acknowledged, etc. So that's what that means. I'm going to go on to the next sonnet, and I, I may even skip over a few. I'll see how I go, because obviously time will be moving against me, as I, I am a communicator. <laughs> Maybe one day I, I do get a platform that's not virtual. Next one is students demand to be educated as intellectuals rather than academics. To study in balanced conditions rather than exhaustion. To enter dialogue, discourse, debate, to challenge and question ideas, to expand infinite possibilities and challenge with courage. To be worthy of a place in world forums. Representing with honour world-class universities that are a class above the status quo of business as usual. So I'm bringing in here the idea of the traditional intellectual. These were people who had intelligences in many areas. They're not just, you know, gone and done a degree in this and then have done a master's in that and then have done a PhD in the same topic. They hang around with the same people. Their ideas are self-reinforcing. Um, what I'm saying here is it's not about rote learning as in I remember this and then I tell you this and I know more than you. I'm smarter than you, <laughs> is what they think. <laughs> Intellectuals are thinking more holistically. They're looking right round the subject, but they're not just doing it in their mind. They're experiencing it as well. Experience is one of the greatest teachers um, in my experience. You cannot understand a thing just by reading about it. You have to actually feel it and experience it to really understand it. Life is third dimensional. It's not actually um, two dimensional through the written word. And what I've certainly explored um, in many of my diaries when I was over in London was I used to look at the difference between that written world and the actual world that I'm moving through as a practical reality and a felt perception. Not just reading peer reviewed authors and saying that's the truth, the whole truth, it's not. It's just a perspective. Everything's up for challenge in the world, and it will be challenged, whether people agree with it or not. To study in balanced conditions rather than exhaustion. I know as, when I was a student, I was always exhausted, um, and I was always amazed at, in my degree, certainly I felt it should be done in four years, not three. And so I wasn't able to really sit back and, and truly enjoy um, the intellectual debate and discussion and really go into the the area and of course I'm also reflecting on humanities here not just science-based stuff or maths-based um, academia where that is more amenable to a global market in respect of language barriers but I'm talking about the humanities of interacting with different viewpoints which is what expands knowledge that's where the real knowledge comes from well, looks like the rain <laughs> is coming <laughs> I'm gonna move my computer which will be fun. So we're going to have to change the location. So expanding infinite possibilities and challenge with courage. I'm all for that. The challenging with courage. <laughs> I'm laughing at myself because I know I've left my copy. I'm going to go get it. So we have to adapt to changing conditions. And that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I laugh at what I've just attempted. I was just going to give you a nice view of nature. Ooh, moving my table. But this is what I love about nature. It's unpredictable. And our nature is the same. So, I'll try and move through this fairly quickly. Let's see. <clears throat> change. This is what we're about. We're here to change the world. And ourselves and we're going to do it together whether we like each other or not this is all going to happen okay allow me to continue with this because I think it's important and I find that poetry for me gives me insights that I could never get from reading a book or even reading online it's not the same that's why I'm sharing it okay to be worthy of a place in world forums we want to extract the excellence out of 
every human being to live to their highest potential. And this is the narrative we need to see in documents talking about the future of universities, the future of um, the knowledge economy, which I always have hesitation around because it's very prescribed by business narratives. I'm very interested in going beyond those vistas. And I think every human being is excited when they start to explore. You only have to look into children, look at how they play and how they're really discovering things. This is the energy of curiosity. It's not just reimagining things, it's curious, it's passionate, it's embracing, it's wondering. This is the right brain uh, aspect to the human way of perceiving and thinking. We want to nurture that. So we want to be a class above the status quo. We don't want to be like every other, every other uh, intellectual institution, I'll call them, across the earth. We don't want it to be just a business because as soon as we bring business as a, as a priority, and I understand why that is happening, I do, but as soon as we make that our most important thing, we lose the enormous potential that's sitting there. I wish to ensure that we don't lose it. I wish to ensure that we go way beyond what we think is possible. So universities are places of great antiquity that advance inquiry into human ethics, philosophy, and higher knowledge. I often talk about this in my videos about the higher knowledge, which comes through to the inspiration that I feel. And as I've explained in some of my videos, it's a, it's a, a, a way of seeing that expands beyond just what we think. It's bringing in a holistic intelligence where we're utilizing all our skills and talents in order to manifest, if you like, a much better world. And that's certainly my intent as well. So we go back in time to some of these original places. We see them communicating with one another. They were in service of expanding civilization's true interests. Some could also argue, well, they were predominantly religious um, forums, but many of the intellectuals were actually coming out of uh, the churches. You know, they were looking into God's world and what it meant. They were well-educated. And, of course, today um, the intellect is perhaps fusing with a more spiritual perspective. And all that spiritual perspective is is really just expanding into um, an aspect of ourselves you can't see. It's like when I sit with someone and I can feel that person. I can't write that down in any mathematical equation. I can only say that through that symbiotic connection, something greater emerged. So it's the unseen that's very powerful. That's not understood um, necessarily given the narrow um, band of focus that is considered to be a, um, just trying to find the right word for that, sort of an intellectual orientation where your expertise is would be a better translation. We want to expand into civilization's true interests. Do we know what that is? What is the true interest of young people? Well, they like to socialise. They want to have fun. They want adventure. They want to travel the world. I very seldom hear them say to me, I want to sit in front of my computer and research until the day I die. I've never heard anyone say that yet. I've, I've heard them you know, talking about their concerns about the way society is going. They feel pretty overwhelmed. They see the problems with their parents. Parents are separating. You know, they see the unhappiness. They, they see the global entertainment industry and they get hooked into it, the computer games. And I might add with the computer games, they lose a sense of presence. It actually rewires the brain as well. If those games could be utilised for, you know, virtual scenarios, that could be good. That's better than just sitting and listening to a teacher. I'd agree. So technology can be utilised in service that way. But it has to be supplemented with real life experience rather than these young people, particularly males, locking themselves in their room for four to eight hours, maybe overnight. <laughs> Some of them do it till four in the morning, playing on the web. 
they're just surfing. They're not really learning. They're getting an idea of things and, they, you know, they might have various interests that they're following. But they're pretty much on their own. It's a pretty isolated reality. And I wonder what implications that has for mental health. Is that factored in, you know, to how we see what's coming? Now, I go on to say, uh, I talk about philosophy and higher knowledge, which was the past, and that's just deep pondering, in service of expanding civilization without corporate interference. Now, that's going to challenge everyone. They go, oh, no, I'm corporate. You're saying I shouldn't be in this. Interference is the word there, meaning the corporate interest believes it knows better, does it? Do some focus groups, do research, find out what really serves these people, and I'll tell you the money will come. You know, it's not just about going out and, and plugging into where the money is. It's about following what the true interests of people are, and that's usually where the money comes, and I know that as an analyst. When we're doing market strat marketing strategy, we no longer are in the sales mode of let's just sell this product, sell this product, and then we try and create and generate interest out there to buy that product. That's what advertising was all about. It was to, to manufacture the need. It was never genuine. It was just, you need to buy this because it's going to make you feel better. As marketing evolved, it became um, more competitive out there. Therefore, they had to develop market wafers, which tapped into what people actually need. That is the future in respect of business. It's going to have to be responsive to what the actual needs of people are because that's what, that's what they want to follow. And there's no resistance in any of that. It's a flow. This is where business could dance with um, society rather than trying to force society to buy its products, forcing them to tick terms and conditions they don't even know what they mean, but truly learning from a values-based paradigm of how can I serve my global society so that it doesn't all just collapse at the same time, but it actually has a future. How can I enshrine within my business paradigm true sustainable initiatives that balance how I consume resources that seek to share as part of a global ecosystem? This eco-education, and I feel the word echo, we don't want, we don't want repeated mantras the ecological educational system has to tap into what is truly innate within human beings if it's real. If it's not real, it's another platitude. It sounds good and connects to sustainability, but we have no idea what that really means. And until we have an idea of what that really means, the system collapses. That's the reality as I see it. Now, this corporate interference has to be um, not the prevailing um, driver. It has to be within a democratic discourse, which is what I've written here. And that means, again, that ecosystem it has to be inter interrelated, interconnected. Everything, all signals being heard and received, sent out, received. Paid for by the people, for the people. Taxes. The fact that government... Funding is being stifled and is being redirected, I note, to defence spending, $200 billion over a period of time, indicates where government is saying that it thinks money should go. I would be interested in polling society and asking them, do you want $200 billion of your taxpayers' money to go into the defence industry to actually create arms in order to hurt other people? This goes against even the educational imperatives of peace and security, which I've read just today as part of the rationale for why we need to expand university education. A holistic agora will look at that and say, well, how is that a priority over education? How is it that the people who are in the hierarchies in education are now forced to go to global marketplaces to bring foreign students in in order to expand their revenue stream. How does that impact on the local students? Is it tokenism, for example, to do 
programs for the underprivileged? Is that just looking like we have a social conscience or, or do we actually have one? These are the discussions that need to happen. The poem goes on to say, paid for by the people, outside the users pay of elitism. So this is pay for service. I remember when users pay first came in. That was when I started economics. It was I was on the threshold of where everything was a public good. I even remember free um, buses, public transport. I remember free education. I was the first year that HEX came in, unfortunately, for me. <laughs> Ended up with a debt. So the user's play of elitism is a definite statement of those who can afford will get access to the knowledge. Is that fair? Is that advancing Australia fair? I don't think so. Why should the privileged few have access to the knowledge which will give them more money in the future? Surely we would want those who are actually underprivileged to have access. So if the foreign students, for example, were the poorest people in, say, Nepal or India or Spain or, you know, wherever in the world they're coming from, Asia, now I would find that very interesting and very innovative. I would actually like that because what it does, it would create an egalitarianism around the world if that was our operating paradigm, not profit maximisation. Do you see the difference? But people would say, oh, well, that's unrealistic. You can't operate from egalitarianism. They can't afford to pay. Well, let's get innovative. They will pay back in different ways. If we just believe wealth is about a money exchange, what if one of those people who's un underprivileged overseas is the Einstein, is the um, Madame Curie, you know, is the Mother Teresa? What if that education gives that person the capacity to really expand their full potential and if that intent behind the education is the maximisation of potential, your infinite possibility slogan manifests. The power and magic that's unleashed through maximising potential in human beings is way beyond the gross domestic product of all nation states on the planet. When you unlock potential in humans, the, the, we'll go way beyond an economic system. This is just, uh, we've created um, exchanges and we call it value. The true value has always been inherent in the human being. You can't have a money system without people. You can't have innovation without imagination. You know, you can't have happiness, you know, without fulfilling your potential. So therefore, the GDP turns into gro gross domestic happiness, becomes the national priority at the government level. See, this is how lateral thinking can change the way we see and the futures that we manifest. We have choice over all of this. If fear is at the basis of our reasons for why we're taking that decision, then it will fail. The whole global economic order is failing because it's out of harmony with the natural system. That's not discussed. We talk sustainability endlessly, thinking that creating products that break down because of chemical processes that we've engineered in, and then we throw them in a bin, which gets tossed in with all the other rubbish, and we call that recycling. We think putting our natural waste in the garden, that, that makes me feel good. I'm, I'm in harmony with the planet. We have no clue about the true sustainability of the natural system. We have no idea of those intricate signals being sent through this holistic system, it's constantly communicating. It's got incredible tolerances for change. We talk about adaptability. We're far less able to adapt. The natural system adapts far better, although our species, of course, would be considered um, one that has survived. But there's probably other stories out there around why that is so. And that, of course, would be a topic that most people don't talk about. So the POM goes on to talk about, again, outside the user's pay elitism, user's pay elitism, that is self-serving and narrow. Well, it has to be self-serving because it's all about preserving that wealth. And it's narrow. It's all about keeping me in the position that I'm happy in. And I'm not saying that's for all people who would 
view themselves as elite. There's a lot of wonderful people. And even those who one could judge as totally self-interested, I've got plenty of room for them as well. They're still brothers and sisters in my paradigm. I'm just saying that from an egalitarian perspective, this is what I see. No one is depreciated as a result of what I see. I'm just here offering perspectives in an agora because I'm demonstrating the importance of democracy. The poem goes on to say, closing off avenues to real learning because it's self-serving and narrow, you see. It's not holistic. For the leaders of tomorrow must know how to lead in principle. They have to come from integrity if it's going to have any real meaning and if it's going to be significantly impacting. And I'm talking significant transformative change, which is what we need right now. Our civilization is dying. <clears throat> Our values are sliding for the higher moral ground is usurped by government governance without conscience or ethics, by corporate interest funding and research for profit. <clears throat> now, this is not having a go at the corporates. It's a reality. Gandhi talked about the corporate world without conscious, conscience. What that means is it disconnects itself. It focuses on what it believes in as a priority. But it's impacting other people's lives, and that's why it's important. I start that sonnet with our civilization is dying. It is. <clears throat> There's one in four with mental health. We've got all sorts of diseases manifesting. Um, the inoculation is creating different strands. Mutation is occurring. People say that the um, oceans will be fished out by 2050. Got massive pollution still being um, sent up into the atmosphere. Our civilization is dying. We're overpopulated. Over what was it, four, four and a half billion, five billion? It's a lot of people. It only becomes a problem in respect of that number given what we consume and how we consume. We haven't yet learned how to consume in ways that balances in the homeostasis of the planet, and that's why we're having a problem. It's a massive problem. It's a massive shift right now. And, of course, when corporates are funding the research, clearly they're not thinking of the betterment of humanity, although they may write that in their proposals. They're looking at markets. It's like genetic modification, you know, of various plants. <clears throat> so Insect-resistant plants. Now, those insects are part of an ecosystem going back to our educational ecosystem. It's holistic. You resist that plant to that particular species, that has a knock-on effect with other species. We create fields of cronola, you know, it's bright yellow patches. It's interesting when you look at it from the sky. I've actually seen loads of agriculture all over the world from the sky, and you see how it's all mapped out. Some of it's very messy. <laughs> Some of it's extremely tidy. The United States, when I was going over the top there, I was noticing that. In Russia, it was all very messy. They had a lot of trees, a lot of, because uh, the corporate system hadn't fully ensued at that point. That was at the time of Perestroika, with, you know, changing paradigm there. So, profit, corporate, divorced from the whole, and I have to say what I think, you know, like the words cancer comes to mind. I just see it as self-replicating problem. But it's destroying the organism, and I mean it in that way. It's just unfettered growth with no limit. It's the right analogy. I can feel it. That's what we have to be conscious about. And the fact that we don't know really what's going on globally. I mean, when I flew around the world, I at least got an idea from the sky. I could have a look at different civilizations. And often when I think of global as a global citizen, which people often talk about but haven't actually done, I see how different we all are too. But I also see the emerging technologies coming in through the satellite dishes and the mobile phones and internet connecting everyone. 
but they're coming from massively different cultural perspectives. People in Kashmir don't think like the people in India. You know, the Inuit don't think like the um, American, you know, you're a mainstream American. You can go anywhere in the world, the indigenous peoples, com they completely think differently from the traditional Western. I always remember going to Alice Springs and seeing the beautiful desert indigenous people sitting on the ground with their artwork. And there I was, Western, white, blonde, blue-eyed. I go sit at a coffee shop. That's how different we are. I remember when I was 20, <clears throat> I was with my partner. We drove around Australia with a caravan. We've, I remember driving into Fitzroy Crossing. The Indigenous were all sitting around a tree. We are at the service station and I felt I'd entered another country. I had. This is not my country. I was born here. These people knew the country. That's why they call it country. They don't call it Australia. They say, welcome to country. They're speaking about the whole country. Even though they're all tribes, Australia has thousands of tribes. They're all different. They've mapped the country. They've even named it. And yet we have the audacity to say it's our country. Nobody owns it. Even the indigenous don't own it, would be my viewpoint from my agora. No one owns the earth. The earth has been here for, has been here for four billion years. I've only been here 53 years this year. It's not a long time. I don't own anything. Nothing belongs to me. So when I have no assets, I, I actually see that as more natural. I don't want to own anything. I don't want to create a demand signal to things I don't need. If I stay in other people's houses, I'm doing a service and creating peace for them, their places looked after. And I'm very careful what I extract from the grid because that's coal burning. That's extracting coal from the planet. The coal is actually the liver of the planet. It was meant to be in the ground. It's not meant to be extracted. The oil, this is all the plant life that's broken down. It's got a weight. You transform it into a gas and you get a weight distribution effect happen. Maybe the axis tilts for the planet. Maybe that's what we're dealing with right now. Does anybody think about that? So I'm going to read the next bit. This is a little bit longer and I'll, I'll try to reflect less on it because I know I'm not going to talk forever on this. Although I've got loads of knowledge I would love to share, I will just have to suffice. I try to make it no more than an hour. <laughs> I could easily continue on because I have an endless flow of thoughts and I'm feeling the thoughts as I'm saying them so this is not why I need to be scripted I'm coming from my inner being and sharing with you that's love that's what love does and I do it unconditionally because I'm here to serve you when I serve you I serve myself that's what nature does this is my true nature expressing through this video from my heart to yours and I don't mind who you are, I will love you the same. Why? Because you are me. What are beliefs? The things that we just believe in, they're not who we are. I can never dislike anyone because I know that wisdom. It's a fundamental truth and if I stray from it, I, I suffer. So let me read this part and I'll allow you to come into a space of meditation around this for your own truth. Don't have to believe me. I'm going to have to start it from the bottom a bit because they actually go together. I can just feel that. A civilization is dying. Our values are sliding. For the high moral ground is usurped by governance without conscience or ethics, by corporate interests funding research for profit, by power parading as privilege. When the real authority is to know thyself and to thine own self be true, for this is the Louvre. Indeed, the masterpiece upon which the greatest leaders weave the social fabric, providing a higher platform from which all can speak, an agora of equality where all are heard with respect, rather than the chosen few with gelled hair <laughs> and sharp business suits, career politicians being seen to be. <laughs> I can see them now. Just saw the Queen then. 
Career politicians being seen to be the new managerialism keeps the classes apart as executives are paid more than teachers. Mm, why is that? As teachers must provide value for money. Or well, they go online. <laughs> Sorry, I have to add that in. And students are indebted for life. Mm. The only prize that matters is future students. As furthering education, learning and intellectualism are the lies. Mm. Peddled as marketing to position the world's top universities, as revenue streams are the only schools for fools who do not question why the Titanic is sinking. Now, I can understand why some people might get offended by that in that particular area, and I send great love and peace to you. Please don't take offence. I will go over it, but sens sensitively. See, the thing with when you write poetry is you allow everything to come. You're not filtering. This is, the, this is filter free. <laughs> and I know that some people might go, oh, you're debunking what I'm working so hard for. Just take it on board is a perspective. I don't think my poem is going to go right around the world and change everything. But I, it's given to you in the spirit of truth and peace and love for the highest good. So, yes, there are going to be feelings within you that great when you hear that, particularly if you're, in, if you're invested in this. But this is democracy. Democracy is about the rub. It's not about removing the rub, it's about inviting it. So I'll go back to this. Now, I didn't read this poem before I read it out to you, and I haven't read it probably for a couple of years now, so I just was surprised to see that I'd written Know Thyself and To Thine Own Self Be True. I often repeat the various things that I say, which shows it's coming from inner self. So we're, we're weaving, I'm seeing from my perspective of a future that's transformative, I'm seeing us weaving the social fabric. But inherent within the weave is this gold thread. That is the purification. The word pure science just comes into my mind here. What was the pure science? E equals MC squared. Energy. And light. Creates. Relativity. Everything's relative. And of course I see that weave is balanced, so all the threads are weaving together in a harmony. This is the harmony of the commons. This is the commonwealth. Providing a higher platform from which all can speak. Okay, everyone needs to talk. The agora of equality, again, coming through this inspiration, rather than the chosen few. Meaning, you guys get, you know, what is it, 80, the 80, the Pareto principle, 80-20? I think it's, it's probably... 199 now, 1% <laughs> 1 of the world's wealthiest, or the um, the 1% have 99% of the resources, something like that. Some will say it's the 20% own 80% of the world's resources. Well, is that fair? Advance Australia fair, which is the beginning of the poem. Is this fairness? Is this equity? Is this diversity? Are we walking the talk when we when we privilege the few. Why should someone be on, you know, 800000 to a million dollars a year when they're working equally as hard as someone who's, who's doing 60 hours a week in a um, middle manager's job or, you know, maybe it's maybe their secretary or whatever they are, we tend to say, oh, well, you're lower than me. You're, you don't have the intellectual background. You're not worth that much. So we automatically enshrine within our roles you're worth more than that other person this is inequality enshrined through income do we want that and then someone say oh you're a socialist <laughs> see i love that the labels get thrown at you you're this you're that no i'm not i'm actually a universalist if i was to and i don't like being limited by labels i'm a universalist i see myself as one with all of it I see myself as not better than anyone, but I don't see myself as less either. So this is why 
we don't want this chosen few getting everything who look all very sharp and, and trendy, they're wearing the best suits, seem to be, and everyone goes, oh, wow, that's such and such, and they go, oh, see, <laughs> I'm, and their ego expands, and that's what happens. Or the career politicians who don't really care about serving the common people, they're so far removed from them, they have their various benefactors who have agendas, and that's what's happening. That's our career politician. They want to get ahead. They want to be seen to be a leader. What is a leader? I wonder if a leader has no followers. Maybe that's the true leadership. Follow yourself. So all these things that I'm reflecting here are the dividing, the dividers. They are what create the inequities that make us all feel empowered or disempowered. The poem goes on to talk about the executives being paid more than the teachers. Again, another inequity. Teachers have enormous knowledge. I, I don't know how the teachers do it. I've had some excellent teachers in my life. I can think of a few now who were just fantastic communicators. The best teachers are usually the best communicators. They're not just talking for the sake of talking. They're really mindful of utilising their experience in the delivery of the message in order for the, the student to identify with this, in order to understand it. The best teachers are the ones that can convey complex ideas in ways that a student can understand. The greatest teachers are the ones that see the students as the teachers who really listen to the student and go, oh, that's very interesting what you've just taught me out of your life experience. I'm impressed by that. Yet they get paid less than executives because we see them as management. We've created stratas. Do we want to do that for a transformative future? I don't know. I personally would like to see us on more. Well, I like the idea of a global basic income where everybody's at least got their basics. So I would at least have money and food. <laughs> I have none of that at the moment, <laughs> which I'm not upset about because I'm in harmony with the natural way of it. And I see an intelligence, of course, in the life. So I'm not afraid of having nothing. But a global basic income for those who are frightened of not having any money or defaulting on payments, that would put them in a position where their basics at least are met and they're not feeling insecure. And then they're not um, running amok because they're panicking. Global basic income also positions people so they can start to think about their full potential. And that's the job of the university, and I say that slowly because I felt the word universe, creating this universe of possibilities. Universities can radically change, um, although I'm noting that there is some resistance with radicalism across the world too, where people are not liking dissent. And I would again say to that, your critic is your greatest teacher. You sit and listen, they have something to say, but it will be for your highest good if you take it in. If you don't, you'll just see them as a threat and you'll get rid of them. And that's the uh, mindset of dictatorial, uh, a dictatorial approach, which is intolerant to diversity. So you can't say on the one hand you're into diversity and on the other hand, if you say something that I'm upset about that offends me, well then you're not embracing the diversity. If you're offended, you need to look at why. It's just another idea, it's only ideas. If people are feeling frightened about something and they're, they're getting together and they're having a say about it, could you be sensitive enough to say, you know what, these people are actually hurting. I think I need to sit and talk with them. Let's discuss what their concerns and, fear, and fears are. And my hope would be that we can work together to alleviate that. That's what democracy looks like. The poem goes on to talk about students being indebted for life. This is a real problem, and I see this as the American system infringing here, where students have to work two jobs in order to go to uni. <clears throat> this is not what this is not teaching them responsibility. It's teaching them to work without rest. They're getting exhausted. Every time I talk to people in cafes who are students, they just find it so hard to do the study. You know, they're exhausted and they're not paid much. It's only 20 bucks an hour, so they're not valued. But they have to pay rent. 
this is the dilemma that's been created through a disconnected um, intellect, intellect that hasn't fully fused with its social responsibility, hasn't understood the family, hasn't stopped to take note of the needs and the concerns of everyone that's their constituent. Not, but I would see them more as a family. That's the way I tend to think. So we don't want to pauperise the students for their whole life so they're paying debts in order to keep them working. That's not an enlightened society. That's more servitude and enslavement, entrapment. That's not love. We don't want people to feel forced to work. We want them to work with delight. We can, if we think about it, we could create, you know, what I've termed um, part-time work paid at three quarters of the full-time wage. So everyone works part-time, job share. Then you're not working ridiculous hours. And when you do come to work, you're excited because you're not working the whole day. You have time to spend with your family. They get to know you. Marriages stay together. They don't fall apart because they never see their partner. See, it's a sort of social. The Norwegians certainly have provided roles, um, paradigms and role models, if you like, of a social economy. People go, oh, socialism, communism. No. It's balance. It's the feminine and the masculine balancing when the social and the economic or the active, I would actually throw out the economic term and say active because I would like to see us become proactive to go beyond um, the simple um, thinking of economics, which is just profit maximising. We do what we have to to get what we want. There's no ethics constraining it because they're having disproportionate power. You know, it goes on and on when you think about it. <clears throat> now, this intellectualism as furthering education, learning and intellectualism are the lies. In the sense that the true objective is the profit maximising, as revenue streams are the only schools for fools who do not question. Okay, so what that's saying, and I'm a fool, so don't worry if you're called a fool, I'm one too. I'll jump into that ring with you so you don't get offended. <laughs> yeah, I'm just simply saying here that the revenue st streams is all they're thinking about. It's profit, revenue, revenue, turnover, <laughs> net profit, <laughs> investments. That's the business paradigm. That's accounting. <clears throat> you put sociologists at the head um, of departments or universities, you're going to get a whole different vision. We're very much believing our thoughts based on what we've been taught. And that's not the big picture. <clears throat> and so this is, I go on to say why the t Titanic is sinking. So for fools who do not question why the Titanic is sinking, the most fundamental reality that's facing all of us is climate change. The weather's all over the place. That should be very concerning for everyone. Our food production, our topsoil is being blown away. And we still sit here going, oh, it's a bright new future, no problem. The fundamentals are not being addressed. Our lack of adaption to the natural state, which would ensure our survival, is not understood and not questioned. It's like a race to the bottom. This is, in a sense, this poem is a wake-up call. You have to look at the reality for what it is on the ground. Without topsoil, you cannot grow food crops. We've got people putting wheat into silos in various nations in order for the price to go up globally. They restrict supply so price rises. That is not serving uh, humanity. That's not serving the public. That's serving oneself because they're trying to manufacture a price signal that favours them without understanding that there are people starving in Africa. That's how disconnected we become when we just have a certain vision and that's it. And that's because we're not training people as intellectuals, where they're learning medicine, a bit of science, they're learning so, um, sociology, psychology, philosophy, art. This is holistic education that informs a new future. It's literally moulding the philosopher's stone the more you change, the shape changes of what you see.
you change, it changes. There is no separation. So the vision of the world that you see and what is actually happening is responding to that vision. The world's collapsing. We need to question the paradigms that are in existence across the world. It's collapsing the planet. Planet's reacting to it. And yet we still see this idealism of, oh, great market here, great market there, because we're still locked into the mind control of various medias that still say, hey, it's fine, it's all good. Emperor has no clothes is what this poem is about. I'm taking, I'm taking the mask off. I'm taking the filter of self-soothing off. That's why it's done in this way. So I go on about new intellectualism is illumination. This is the inspiration that I'm living in it right now. It's to illuminate holistically. Managerial, managerialism is that economics. It's, it's professional managers who are discarding principled leadership, thinking it's just idealism. It's not. People respect the principles when they're lived. They don't respect managers that don't walk the talk. And they are looking to see if you do. I know I've worked in hundreds of companies, I've seen it. Life becomes the modus operandi of real study. So studying life, integrating higher ideals, ideals with experience. This gives us much more grounded perspectives. We're not just postulating, but we feel it in our experience. An enlightenment that no longer suffers fools, which means we can't be holding back. We have to speak up. We can't just say, oh, well, it's fine. Planets collapsing. Next generation could have serious. I'll re rearrange that. The words that are coming to me is will have serious issues to deal with and do have that right now. As denial is swept aside in the face of truthful inquiries, so we get rid of the denial. Oh, the, the climate's not changing. This is the climate skeptic stuff. We saw that. It's still going on. I just read an article about a university being approached by a previous government here in Australia who were seeking to do research that further um, supported, if you like, an um, intellectual who was not in favour of climate change. Al Gore talked about an inconvenient truth, the massaging of the media through these opinion pieces, again debunking the reality of climate change. That's a massive disservice to society and that actually um, has to be addressed. It's really important that that doesn't, that's not allowed when people know that it's not true and they're doing it because of their industry interests. This is where business is problematic because they can only see their own interests. They can't see the whole picture. That's a worry. We don't want this denial. So it goes on to say, as denial is swept aside in the face of truthful inquiries that seek harmony as the goal rather than profit motives. This is harmony with all of it. Harmony with different cultures overcoming the violence where we actually respect that difference. We don't say you should be like us, aren't we great? We sit with humility with other people from different cultures and say, please share with me what you've learned. I've seen some of the greatest poets in the Middle East, Persian um, philosophers, Rumi, we know nothing about the intellectuals. I knew that when I was at Griffith Uni, actually. I remember when I was studying economics, I thought we're only getting Western economic systems. We're not learning about Iraq or you know, Russia. Or, or I wondered about the other cultures that could have had an input into this that didn't. It was Western intellectual discourse that's absolutely obsessed with its own perspective. Although today in this globalised society, people are mixing it up. But still that Western paradigm is seen as superior because of the economic wealth that others are aspiring to and greedily want to, wanting to pick it up. 
to feel they've got success, their families are happy, you know. It's a very simple idea. So a harmonic convergence of world communities are the new motifs. This is the harmony. We're one. That will lead nation states into a renewable epoch. It's not only renewable in the sense of resources. We're actually transforming ourselves. We are what's going to be renewable. It's like a rebirth into something very new that we've never been, we've never been there before. Where sustainability is not a buzzword, but put into action. It's got to have a real meaningful base to it, like um, well, the eco-philosophers. I learnt that in peace studies when I did peace studies. The eco-philosophers, deep ecology, where we're connecting <clears throat> our values, our sense of wholeness to the deep ecology. Food outlets are selling healthy, food, healthy organic food. They're not selling this fast food. It's rubbish. We call that enlightened. It's not. No waste materials are permitted. We start to get people focusing on using everything like the indigenous did. No waste. We chuck everything in the bin and we go, oh, well, I might buy a new car. Oh, I'm sick of this um, computer. I want a more upgraded Apple Mac, you know. All lighting is solar or wind generated. We can design houses. I've been in e ecological houses overseas, actually. Um, where was I? Austria. When I came back from Russia when I was with Patch. I remember having a look at some flats that were actually ecologically designed and they're, they have the double glazed windows and thermal uh, heating, solar in the ceiling, in the roof. Everyone had hot water, all generated from the sun. Wind generator, we've got plenty of places on the earth. Um, just thinking, over in Europe, there's lots of flat plains. Lots of places where you could capture the wind. Denmark, I think I just thought up around that region, I remember some very flat areas. In the Midwest, the United States, very flat. Middle of Australia is very flat. And maybe there's ways of generating the wind. I don't know. I see magnetics as um, the key but doing it very carefully because you don't want to upset the magnetic field. But perpetual motion is what I'm thinking about with magnets. Um, Tesla talked about the ionizing. He's the one that designed Wi-Fi anyway, turn of the century. He was brilliant. From Czechoslovakia, I think Tesla was. And uh, he went under the wing, unfortunately, of the industrialists over there, JP Morgan. When they realised they couldn't meter the um, free energy that he'd created, they got rid of him. Apparently he was very depressed on the 10th storey of a building in New York before he died because he had all these brilliant ideas of harnessing energy and they were just shelved. After he died, military came and took his patents. He was in service to humanity. He was one of these incredibly gifted. He was getting flashes of ideas coming into his mind. So when I talk about mystical things, it's not um, unreal, it's real. People have inspiration all the time. This is normal. When we let go of the thinking mind and we come into the intuitive self. So going back to this last section of the poem, all decisions are participatory and inclusive. So everyone has ownership here as this is the real foundation stone of our common future, a lantern that lights the new path. For self-reflection is the wisdom that informs. For we must think differently as never before, as economic and ecological collapse is imminent. And this is the pink elephant in the room that business as usual denies. For the real climate is changing and it is time to act now. So that's the poem. I've obviously felt it important to go right, right through it. <laughs> Everything with me is intuitive. I just go from my inner feeling. That is the way I see, and that's why we need to have tolerance and acceptance to diverse viewpoints. We don't just get rid of them because they bother us. 
they have a message. And the message is for your highest good. And your message to me is for my highest good as well. Because you are equal to me. No one is less than me. I'm just here in service, sharing what I know with the flowering expectation that at some point there will be a resonance with new futures that are not only sustainable, but as I've said in other videos, expanding beyond belief. And I have gone over my hour, <laughs> one hour 15, woohoo! <laughs> Can I do it underwater? Someone will probably say that to me. Probably. <laughs> oh, well, that's my gift. <laughs> you don't have to listen to the whole thing. <laughs> this is wealth. This is abundance. This is joy. This is love. That will spend an hour of my time giving for you, to you for nothing. <laughs> and you don't even have to watch it. So again, I felt inspired to share that. This is not... Us and them, this is us. I am part of you, you're part of me. I'm just another aspect. So with that, I send you enormous love and peace and joy. And I also wish that your vision, your imaginings come true for you. I'm here to support whatever it is that people want to create and learn from. But I'm also going to speak my truth in my Agora. So thank you for sitting in my Agora. And I look forward to sharing more wonderful ideas in the future. And in time, I will invite more and more people into this Agora. Welcome to democracy, a global democracy. Much love. <laughs>